Greetings, I'm Daniel Jacobson, director of the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization. And tonight, it's my pleasure to be joined by Robert Riley. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our, uh, the way that we run things here, uh, you can ask questions. There'll be a Q&A after Mr. Riley's talk. Um, you can ask questions anytime um, during the talk um, or after. Go to the bottom of your screen. If you, if you uh, toggle your mouse a little bit, you'll see Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions that way. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. I also want to let you know about uh, our next talk, which will be Kevin Williamson a week from tonight, um, Tuesday, March 23rd, the same time. Um, he'll be talking on the disciplinary corporation. That's um, another in our series, The Canceled. Um, tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce Robert Riley. Robert R. Riley is director of the Westminster Institute. He's taught at the National Defense University, where he served in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Um, excuse me, and served in the office of the Secretary of Defense, where he was senior advisor for information strategy. He participated in Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003 as senior advisor to the Iraqi Minister of Information. Before that, he was director of Voice of America. He's the author of The Closing of the Muslim Mind, How Intellectual Suicide Created the Modern Islamist Crisis, and The Prospects and Perils of Catholic Muslim Dialogue. He'll be speaking to us tonight on the challenge posed to American pluralism by non-pluralistic ideologies. Mr. Riley, welcome. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, John Eastman for having invited me to do this, and of course, uh, Professor Jacobson for hosting the event. Well, uh, the topic, as you heard, is the challenge posed to American pluralism by non-pluralistic ideologies. I would contend that ideologies, by their nature, are not pluralistic, but monistic, and in fact, monolithic. I'm going to talk about the nature of ideologies a little later. My general thesis is that what is threatening American pluralism today is a process of re-tribalization. But uh, before we can understand that threat, we have to understand what tribes were historically and how they functioned. This will require a trip to pre-philosophical periods of history. Let me state at the outset that what ties the tribalisms, the tribalism of the ancients with the neo-tribalism of modern ideologies is the incapacity to recognize other persons as human beings. In in terms of the ancient tribes, this was not a chosen incapacity. In terms of modern ideologies, it is a willful incapacity uh, that involves the denial of the existence of human nature. Either way, the grounds for pluralism, which is that all people are created equal, disappears. Now to ancient tribes, a tribe is a group of people related by blood who worship the same gods. A tribal ruler was especially associated with the gods. He was most likely either divine himself or perhaps semi-divine. In any case, only he knew the magic words by which the gods may be moved. And it was through the tribal ruler that they could be reached. In the pre-philosophical world, the inability to distinguish the nature of things from convention was at the basis of the tribal mentality. People deemed each other's actions to be right or proper only to the extent that they conformed to the customary, customary way of things that had been done before and wrong to the extent that they differed. There was no standard other than, quote, the ways of our fathers, unquote. One was only a tribal member with duties to one's tribal gods and ancestors and nothing beyond. Consequently, nothing could be right or wrong in and of itself. In other words, by nature, people who worshiped other gods and lived by different standards, members of other tribes or subjects of other empires simply did not belong to one's own 
say, quote unquote, species, as it were. They had different fathers in different ways. The identification of the individual in the tribe was total. A person could not understand himself or herself outside of the tribe. Now to enslave or slaughter a member of another tribe fit perfectly within the order of the tribal view. For example, when the Assyrians successfully sallied forth to conquer another people, they would also defeat the gods of that people. The ancient understanding was that your city would only do as well as your gods were powerful. After all, what were the local gods for if not to protect their votaries? If a city lost at war, the ancients assumed that its gods had been defeated and subjugated by the greater powers of the victor's gods. No one could imagine moral grounds on which to object to this. The vanquished couldn't object to it because they know they would have done the exact same thing had they been victors. Significantly, there was often no word for human being, no concept of personhood. An appeal to humanity would not have been intelligible either to the victors or the vanquished because they both suffered from the incapacity to see another person as a human being. From his observations of Native American tribes in 1793, Nathaniel Chipman touched upon some of the invariable characteristics of the tribal mentality of pre-philosophical peoples. Quote, among their different tribes, the injuries of an individual are resented as national. The possession of a hunting ground is to them the possession of an empire. These are sources of frequent wars waged with the most savage ferocity the butchering and scalping of old men, women and children, the torturing and burning of prisoners in cold blood, with the most shocking circumstances of cruelty um, are among their pastimes. These are not secret acts of violence. They are by none considered as wrong. They are public transactions performed under what is to them the law of nations." Unquote. Speaking of other kinds of tribes, including ancient ones, Chipman observed, quote, so universal is the state of war among such people that in almost every language, the same word originally signified both foreigner and enemy. How else to consider someone who's a member of so different from oneself that they are of a different tribe? Those unfamiliar with the ancient lineage of tribal thinking will also not be able to understand it when they encounter it today. A contemporary example of tribal mentality comes from Iraq's Al-Anbar province. Speaking of what will be done to his tribal opponents, a leader said in late 2014, quote, this is a tribal issue for us right now. There's no way to let them live. I'm not going to leave any of them alive. It's them, their family members, and all their property, unquote. We're, oh no, and their property, we're going to destroy them all, unquote. Note that tribal vengeance can be taken upon any member of an offending tribe, not necessarily upon the tribal members responsible for the grievance, because what really exists is the tribe not the individuals who are part of it. Therefore, it is the tribe that must be punished and any part of it will do for that purpose. Now, in the West, we, we are often uh, confused when we're attacked by say jihadists who uh, shoot down people in an auditorium in Paris or cut someone's throat who happens to be passing by on a London street because we don't understand the tribal mentality from which it comes. Any of us as Westerners or as Romans, as they often refer to anyone in the West as a Roman, uh, is, is liable as a member of their opposing tribe to be slaughtered by them as vengeance for the humiliation they have suffered. Well, 
In any case, wherever and for so long as the tribal mentality prevails, modern constitutional order is difficult, if not impossible, to develop. In Saudi Arabia, King Salman explained why his country cannot consider democracy. Quote, if Saudi Arabia adopts democracy, every tribe would be a party, unquote, and the country would be impossible to govern. The tribal mentality is obviously inimical to the principle of equality, which is at the foundation of modern constitutional rule. One cannot say that all men are created equal until one knows what man is, which requires as well a knowledge of the differences between nature and convention, the human and the non-human and the human and the, and the divine. These definitions were reached with the advent of philosophy in ancient Greece. This is one of the most extraordinary stories in human history. When it occurred to the pre-Socratic philosophers that the order that they were observing in the world was rational that it was through their minds, their reason that they could come to apprehend this order. Why they wondered, is this so? How can this be? Heraclitus speculated that there must be behind this rational order, a divine intelligence of which this rational order is an expression. And he is the first one so far as we know who used the Greek word logos, meaning reason, to describe this divine intelligence. So man could through his reason apprehend the laws of this logos as they were manifested in the world and through the world at least come to the supposition of the existence of this divine intelligence. Now, as this idea developed both in Plato and in Aristotle, we see the notion of natural law uh, occurring. Now, Aristotle posited, excuse me, that a thing's nature is what made it uh, what it is and why it can't be something else and how its end, which defines its nature, uh, gives us an understanding of those things which are good for it and those things which are not. Just to take a quick example, an, an acorn. An acorn, if all the conditions are present and in, in adequate water and decent soil, will grow into a fully mature oak tree. That would be, according to Aristotle, the perfection of the oak tree. Uh, at, at, no long, at no point along its trajectory will it become a giraffe or something else. It has the nature of an oak and we know what the perfection of that oak tree is. It's a fully mature oak tree. Now, the same thing can be understood in terms of a human being, but with this difference, that unlike uh, plants or animals, man has free will. And he alone among creatures can choose either to act in conformity with his nature or deliberately frustrate it. That is, he can undertake those actions which lead to the perfection of his nature, or he can choose not to do so. Aristotle develops a moral vocabulary to describe those actions. Those that are in conformity with the natural law are moral for man and those which frustrate his nature are called immoral. Now, Aristotle, what's more, says that the end of man, that is the end for which he is made, what all men desire uh, is happiness. And that avenue to happiness is reached in the same way by everyone through virtue, through vir the virtues, virtuous behavior the habit of virtue and the habit of perfect virtue is what leads to that happiness which all people desire. Now, there is another development within this, which is extremely striking for our subject. Now we know what a human being is, as opposed to a plant or an animal, or indeed the gods. 
we know what he's for, happiness, we know how he should reach it. We also know, according to this moral vocabulary that Aristotle has developed, what's just and what is unjust. And therefore, what justice is applies to all people everywhere at all times. To quote from Aristotle, quote, universal law is the law of nature. There really is, as everyone to some extent divines, a natural justice and injustice that is binding on all men, even on those who have no associate or are covenant with each other, unquote. You see, this spells the end of tribal man as soon as you can come to an understanding such as this. So if men are ordered to the same good, regardless of where they live or who they are, then there must be this single standard of justice that transcends the political standards of any city. In the most powerful Roman articulation of Aristotelian teaching, Cicero said, quote, true law is right reason, right and natural. Its validity is universal. It is immediate and eternal. It commands, its commands and prohibitions apply effectively to good men and those influenced by them, uninfluenced by them are bad. Any attempt to supersede this law, to repeal any part of it is sinful, to cancel it is entirely impossible. Neither the Senate nor the assembly can exempt us from its demands. There will not be one law in Rome, one in Athens, or one now and one later, but all nations will be subject all the time to this one changeless and everlasting law. For God, who is its author and promulgator, is always the sole author and sovereign of mankind." Unquote. Well, this is obviously even a precursor to the Declaration of Independence. And as you, I'm sure you know, Cicero had a profound influence on the American founders. Well, now we fast forward to the idea of ideology, modern ideology, the retribalization of man in its terms. Now I mean by ideology, not any set of ideas, but specifically a truncated view of reality, a spiritually pathological, magical reconstruction of reality or of a second reality. Eric Vogelin, on whose thoughts I am relying for this, wrote that, quote, all Gnostic movements are involved in the project of abolishing the constitution of being with its origin in divine transcendent being, unquote. Vogelin enumerated a few elements of ideology that he took to be essential. One, apocalypse. The idea that this present world of imperfection will be followed by a more perfect phase. Two, Gnosticism. Knowledge of how to bring about the more perfect world. Three, immunitization. That human action on earth rather than divine action in a transcendent realm will bring about the desired end. And for scientism, the belief that modern science will assist us in finally transforming man and his natural world into paradise. Modern ideology can only be accurately understood as a pseudo religion, an ersatz plan for salvation, for the transformation of the world into something which it could never become but for the force of the ideology. By removing the locus of man's salvation from the spiritual and the transcendent, and by placing it within history and the material, it transforms politics into religion and usually the state or the party into the engine of salvation. This is why the true ideologue exhibits the fervor of a religious zealot. The ideological enterprise tries to solve the problem of human existence of evil here in this world. Ideologies are necessarily aggressive. Napoleon said, 
I must conquer to survive. He understood that because he had no other sense of legitimacy. He had come to power through a coup d'etat and he wasn't a Bourbon. He had to conquer to survive. This might well be the slogan of ideologies. They must conquer to survive. They're always threatened by whatever remains of reality. Modern ideologies in this sense are a revolt against the human condition itself. Excuse me. Let's recall the socialist ideologies of Nazism and Marxism and communism, both of which denied that all people are created equal, the one because of its race theory of history and the other because of its class theory of history. For Karl Marx, man is fundamentally determined by the material dialectic as it expresses itself in the economic conditions of class. That was his one big thing through which all else had to be seen. Ideology is always reductionist. By definition, people cannot think or act outside of the way they are materially determined to think or act by their self-interest and for no larger purpose. And he purported larger purpose is really just a screen for a class maintaining its economic dominance. Nazism simply substituted race for class, but otherwise functioned in much the same way. Grotesque dehumanization was the hallmark of both of these reductionist ideologies, which cost so many their freedom and or their lives. To give you a little flavor of the millenarian character of these ideologies, here is Karl Marx, quote, the religion of the workers has no God because it seeks to restore the divinity of man, unquote. Adolf Hitler said, open quotes, humanity accomplishes a step up every 700 years and the ultimate aim is the coming of the sons of God. All created forces will be concentrated in a new species. It will be infinitely superior to modern man. Those who see a national socialism, nothing more than a political movement, know scarcely anything of it. It is more even than a religion. It will create mankind anew, unquote. You see the metaphysical ambitions involved in both of these ideologies to change the nature of reality itself. One need only recall Hitler's proclamation of, quote, a declaration of war against the order of things which exist, against the state of things which exist, in a word against the structure of the world which presently exists, unquote. Now these ideologies were a direct threat to the United States and its founding principle that all people are created equal. The United States prevailed, first of all, over the race creed of slavery in the Confederacy, and then over the Nazi race theory of history and the Marxist-Leninist class theory of history. The United States is not based upon a theory of history, but upon the laws of nature and nature's God. We more recently have confronted the threat of what has been called radical Islam or Islamism, which has all the features of a totalitarian ideology in its dehumanization of parts of mankind. Islamism is an ideology in the classic sense in that it offers or rather insists upon a, a, an alternative reality, a second reality that collapses the separate realms of the divine and the human and arrogates to itself the means for achieving perfect justice here in this world. It places alongside reality its false version and insists that reality conform to its demands. Its adherents live in the magical world of this second reality and obey its laws. They may seem to live and move in the realm of the real world, but they are already transposed into the second false reality. When they behave according to its laws, for example, by slaughtering innocent people without remorse, Others are surprised and disturbed because they do not know the contours of the second reality, 
which has just been so shockingly imposed upon them. The means for the transformation of reality into the alternative reality is, as in all ideologies, as it was in Marxism, Leninism, in fascism, and in uh, Nazism, force, force based upon absolute power. While most ideologies are secular attempts to displace religion as the main obstacle to fulfillment, Islamism is based upon a deformed theology that nonetheless shares in the classical ideological conflation of heaven and earth. It is exactly in these terms that its chief ideologue, Sayyid Qutb, spoke, quote, Islam chose to unite earth and heaven in a single system, unquote. This means that transcendent ends will be achieved by earthly means, as Qutb says, quote, to reestablish the kingdom of God upon earth, unquote. He has collapsed the border between the imminent, imminent or this world, the universe, and the transcendent. That's gone. It's all now a single system in which his ideology operates. It should be no surprise that in its political manifestation, Qutb's single system duplicates the features of the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century's secular ideologies. <clears throat> in such a state, said Qutb's ideological soulmate, Malona Madudi, quote, no one can regard any field of his affairs as personal and private. Considered from this aspect, the Islamic state bears a kind of resemblance to the fascist and communist states, unquote. Hassan al-Banna, Qutb's hero and the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, regarded the Soviet Union under Stalin as the model of a successful one-party system which the Islamists were seeking. <clears throat> So much for those external threats to the United States from these modern ideologies, what might threaten it uh, from within, in which we see the same features of these ideologies or things like them. Well, as you well know, there are a growing number of people, including the radical left elements in the street demonstrations and demolitions of the summer of 2020, who think that America should not have been and, and perhaps today should not be. Today, we're witnessing the retribalization of society through so-called identity politics, which appears to be a melange of race and class theories of history jumbled together. Racist anti-racism is just another way of denying a common humanity and has its source in a spiritual disorder similar to the ones animating the other ideologies. At least that is what their language seems to reveal. It's what it sounds like. For instance, listen to the architect of the 1619 project, the New York Times project that posited that uh, the origins of the United States were not in 1776, but in 1619 when the first African slaves were imported and sold to the English colonists at that time. Well, long ago, the, the author, the, the organizer of this 1619 project and its lead essayist, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones wrote that, quote, the white race is the biggest murderer, rapist, pillager, and thief of the modern world. The descendants of these savage people pump drugs and guns into the black community, pack black people into the squalor of segregated urban ghettos and continue to be bloodsuckers in our community, unquote. It sounds a bit like the Lenin on the bourgeoisie or Hitler on the non-Aryans. Black Lives Matter organization professed what we believe on its webpage. In part, it stated, quote, inspired by the 31 takeover of the Florida State Capitol by Power U, we took to the streets 
we are self-reflexive and do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement. We foster a queer affirming network when we gather. We do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. We embody and practice justice liberation and peace in our engagements with one another, unquote. When the circulation of this statement proved embarrassing uh, as a public relations matter, uh, BLM scrubbed it from their website. In 2015, Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors revealed, open quotes, the first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Myself and Alicia Garza, her co-founders in particular, are trained organizers, we are trained Marxists. We are supervised, we are super versed on sort of ideological theories, unquote. The program is always the same. Society responsible for all evils must be destroyed or fundamentally altered. To promote universal brotherhood, the natural family must be eliminated. Once society is atomized, once the natural family ceases to interpose between the individual and the state, the state or the party is free to transform the isolated individual by force into whatever version of new man the revolutionary visionaries espouse. The president of Greater New York BLM, Hawk Newsom, said in an interview, open quotes, if this country doesn't give us what we want, then we will burn down this system and replace it, all right? And I could be speaking figuratively, I could be speaking literally. It's a matter of interpretation. I just want black liberation and black sovereignty by any means necessary, unquote. Note black sovereignty, not popular sovereignty, but a racial sovereignty. Similarly, the, the disruption project claims that quote, when mass numbers of people stand up and take action against the unjust systems of racial capitalism, the hetero patriarchy, white supremacy and settler colonialism, we have the ability to force ruptures and dismantle these systems, unquote. This, res this will result in, open quotes, a different society where everyone has what they need to live and adequate leisure time, unquote. Similar to the Marxian classless utopia where, as Marx said, one can, quote, hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, unquote, just as one desires. As these ideas are similar, so will be their results. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's talk <clears throat> briefly about the other extremes of the self-identification movement, which are undermining any notion of the common good because they are basically because they basically deny the existence of nature and natural law. If we don't know what we are or who we are, we can self-identify as anything. This self-identification is not the result of knowing oneself, but of willing oneself. If what one wills is the principal constituent of reality, there's no standard by which one act of will can be differentiated from any other act of the will. Therefore, a man can self-identify as a woman. It seems that one can self-identify as anything. However, why can't I self-identify as someone who finds this utterly absurd? Why can't I call a privation of the good, as Aristotle would call it, a privation of the good to mutilate oneself, instead of being obligated to call it a good? unless I want to be canceled, that is. Let's transpose 
self-identity talk to an early, earlier period to illustrate its absurdity. The Nazis who believed in the primacy of will, self-identified as racist haters of Jews and Slavs, whom they proceeded to slaughter and enslave. Did opposition to this arise because the opponents simply self-identified as anti-Nazis? No, it arose among those who held that all men are created equal is a universal truth and that therefore what the Nazis were doing was objectively evil and must be stopped. Today, we are living in a period of moral and cultural self asphyxiation. It will end us if we don't return to reality soon. Our current decline is because the natural law perspective that animated our founders is being lost. For only by abandoning the general principles of natural law can one imagine liberty as autonomy of self or as a source of self-identification. The men who set forth a new nation would have found completely objectionable this misunderstanding of freedom. The idea of freedom as contentless choice was totally alien to them, as would be the idea that liberty is the right to define one's own self. For them, the meaning of ourselves originates not in ourselves, but in the laws of nature and of nature's God, to which we must return if we are to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for a stimulating talk. Let me, let me remind uh, our audience that you can ask questions by going to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, uh, clicking on it, and then typing in your question. I'll be happy to pass them on to Robert. Let's start here. I remember that after the terrorist attack of 9-11-2001, there was a phrase that was used, thrown around a lot, and sometimes thrown around so often that it became sort of a, a, a matter of, of, of some humor, dark humor. Um, if we do this, or if we don't do that, then the terrorists will have won, it was said. If we don't go to, if we don't continue, keep holding mass events, for instance, out of fear, then the terrorists will have won, or things like that. Once it became clear, which it wasn't immediately, but once it became clear that Al-Qaeda did not um, have nuclear capacity or a, a dirty bomb or a large supplies of anthrax after, a, after a few months of, of great panic where that seemed like it was quite plausible. Um, it was hard, at least for me, to, to envision how the terrorists could win. But something I've been thinking about that your talk uh, uh, stimulates is, is, is this idea. If we turn Americans against each other and against American ideals and institutions, for instance, by tearing down statues of the founders and, um, and inculcating the idea that, um, that the, entire, the, the ideals uh, of America are fundamentally corrupt, systemically corrupt, um, will the terrorists have won in a sense? Not obviously, not militarily, but ideologically? Well, thank you for that question, uh, Dan. I, I just, I don't think that we can hold Al-Qaeda responsible for the retribalization of American society. Um, I, I, you know, the Islamist ideology is something I spent a lot of time studying as I spent an even longer time studying Islam itself. I would, what I would, what I saw in Islamist ideology was actually, and as you would understand from the, the quotes from uh, Maududi, an influence from Western totalitarian ideologies on it. Um, so, and I don't think those come back at us through Islamism. Of course, there, there is a, a small present presence of Muslims in the United States. And I, I, I for one, do not view that as a problem. Uh, 
and for reasons which we can go into uh, if, if you want me to expatiate on that particular point. So I think we have to look uh, uh, somewhere else at this, those sources of our retribalization here in these ideological notions, which I could just touch upon briefly with a couple of quotations from some of those people who, who apparently see themselves as tribal now along either you know, racial or other ideological grounds. Thanks. Uh, here's a question from Elizabeth Eastman. Uh, with, with respect to your comments about Rome, there are references in ancient Rome to tribes. Are these familial associations that do not compete with what you describe as existing in Rome? Um, is it similar to the tribal associations that exist in the Middle East, or is it something else altogether? Well, I think that um, well, it depends when in the existence of Rome where we're talking about. Uh, obviously, at the time of Cicero in the late Republic and the early Empire, there was this natural law notion, and particularly in the Stoics, it wasn't universally shared, but at least it was present. And the empire, um, as you know, extended a rather, um, uh, it allowed for pluralism to a, to a large degree. People even got to keep their, their own gods so long as they agreed to worship the emperor. Um, Rome itself was threatened by tribes, as you well know, by Germanic and other tribes and had to defend itself against them. That doesn't mean that some tribes that existed uh, within Rome did not also share in the more primitive uh, pre-philosophical view that tribes had of themselves. But Rome, after all, was a culture permeated. I mean, Rome's culture was Greek culture. So it had been permeated by these philosophical notions. Great. Someone asks, um, how can we encourage a sense of common humanity among younger generations that are encouraged to take a tribal stance by social media incentives and tribalized message they messages they receive in their schooling? Well, I think that they, they ought to attend seminars at the Benson Center. <laughs> I think that, um, well, it's, it's hard to, how do you get them to study natural law? They have to have some idea of, you know, the structure of existence of, um, what makes things what they are and uh, what the order of the universe is constituted by. If, if they're indifferent to these things, they, they, they will be um, subject to, to all of these other influences. Other, they will be controlled by the thoughts of others instead of having their own. And I would strongly recommend instead of tearing down the statues of the founders, studying the founders, studying their profound understanding of natural law and seeing what sources they themselves drew upon. And they tell us, they drew upon Cicero, they drew upon Aristotle, as well as a number of thinkers in the Western tradition, all of which supported and conveyed that natural law thinking. Um, in fact, since Dan didn't mention my latest book, I will, because this is a great way. Please, I apologize. To, no, to answer the question, but my, my latest book is called America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding. And in it, I asked the question, what made the American founding conceivable? From where did its ideas derive? What, what what is its lineage? And this takes me on a trip through several millennia 
in identifying those sources in, in Athens and Jerusalem and Rome as well as up through the Middle Ages and into the thoughts, uh, into the thought of, of more modern, such as John Locke, of course. I, I think what this, that last question was, th thank you for that answer. I think th what the last question was picking up and, and, and what p picking up on, and what I was wondering about sort of stemmed from your suggestion at the very beginning uh, uh, of your talk that you saw tribalization as the, the primary problem in US politics now. Um, I think there are, I think a lot of us feel something similar to that. Um, would you go so far as to, to say that do, in your opinion, does, does increasing US tribalism threaten our democratic institutions if we, if we fail to, to read your new book, which um, is available at Amazon? <laughs> find booksellers everywhere I'm trying to make up for uh for my it own hasn't, it, it hasn't been canceled yet no <laughs> um yeah i, I think I, that because that is the logical outcome of these processes that we we see and whether this radical self-identification takes place in racial terms as was evident in in some of those quotations that i i read to you um, or whether it's in sexual terms in the, in the transgender movement, which is as much a denial of the laws of nature and of nature's God as, as anything that I think we have encountered. And it, it is developing its, um, its measures of enforcement. Uh, where This is not, it's not voluntary. As you know, in certain states, parents who might be worried that their child is confused about their, their gender uh, can't take them to see a therapist, that that would be against the law. Um, I live in Fairfax County, Virginia, and some of the teachers here in the public schools um, are being required to teach a new curriculum with the transgender ideology. And some teachers uh, are, are wondering if there's going to be a conscience clause or freedom of religion because they are determined not to teach the children what they know to be a lie about humanity that might lead to their chemical and then surgical mutilation. Um, we, we saw this in the, the undermining of the primacy of the natural family in the LGBT movement. Uh, so this, this is, it just, it's as I quoted from Napoleon, you know, I have to conquer to, to survive. So it is with these ideologies, whether it's a, this kind of sexual ideology or racial ideology, uh, all of them deny the laws of nature and as such, they require coercive instruments of enforcement to survive, and they must extend their control in order to survive. That's why others have referred to these movements as totalitarian. There are a couple of questions that pick up on, uh, on, on what you've been saying here. Here's a, here's a more practical one, and then we'll go to a a more theoretical one. The, the practical one is this. Um, how would you see the abortion issue fitting into your analytical paradigm? Are there those who are pro-abortion, are those who are pro-abortion to be defined by political tribes or a novel tribalism of personal convenience? Well, I think that for some people it is a matter of personal convenience but even to exercise it as a matter of personal convenience involves an act of rationalization. And the act of rationalization is that my unborn child is not a human being. Um, people who want to follow the science know that for, for quite some time in the field of fetology, we have known that an unborn child is a human being. And uh, that is why in the 19th century, 
in this country around the same time, as around the 1860s and afterwards, it was the medical community itself that lobbied for laws against abortion in the various states. So how is it in the 20th century around the time of Roe v. Wade that all of a sudden we, we didn't know that anymore? When in fact, we knew much more than did doctors in the 19th century with more a great deal more certitude and exactitude of when a new human being comes into existence. Now to deny that reality uh, which leads to the elimination of another person. Talk about denying the personhood of another being in incapacitated from recognizing another person of human being. I think the abortion ideology is it in spades. It is part of an ideological project. That doesn't, while at the same time understanding as you pointed out when you asked your question, you know, is it a matter of convenience? It may be a matter of, of uh, enormous pressure placed upon the woman who has it done, uh, for whom it's not always entirely voluntary. But um, I would suggest to anyone who has doubts about what goes on and an abortion, that all you have to do is watch a sonogram of an abortion, then you'll know. And if you're for that, good luck to you. Here, here's a more theoretical question picking up on your, uh, there are a couple in the queue um, about, uh, about your appeal to natural law. So this is from the Associate Faculty Director of the Benson Center, Shiloh Brooks. He asks, uh, you argue that establishing one's intellectual orientation by means of self-identification is an act of will. You oppose this to an intellectual ori orientation guided by natural law. You indicate uh, by this opposition that you don't think the natural law interpretation of the world is an act of will, but rather is objective. Can you say more about why the natural law interpretation of the world is not an actively willed interpretation? In other words, what lends the natural law interpretation an absolute authority and veracity over and above other interpretations? Doesn't the act of knowing always involve an act of interpretation and thereby an act of willing the world to conform to the structures of the mind? No, because I think the, the attempt to understand the world uh, as it is, is different from uh, the attempt to change it. You know, as Marx said, philosophers, or something like this, philosophers heretofore have tried to understand the world. Now that's over, we're, we're going to change it. And we will force the world to conform to our ideas. Now, obviously it, it is, it's going to be a matter of interpretation for the simple reason that our minds are limited and that we are not at any time capable of comprehending the whole, but only a part of the whole. Uh, and someone else may be seeing somewhat different part of that whole. And that's why we talk to each other and we can have rational discourse about why can't you see what, what I see will show it to me. And the, the evidence for it is in objective reality, not in our wills. And our obligation as human beings is to conform ourselves to what is. You know, as Aristotle said, man doesn't get to make himself to be man. He's what's given, that he, he exists. And you, 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 so when you come to understand what something is, then you understand its nature or its essence. Now I'd say the modern enterprise is explicitly a denial of the existence of essences. Uh, to say that there is only existence as Jean-Paul Sartre and others famously said, uh, existence precedes essence, which is a metaphysically incoherent statement, but it, it leaves man uh, with sort of maximum uh, you know, freedom it's a terrifying freedom that he has to, 
he, he must make himself up because he really isn't anything. Now that is definitely uh, an act of will. And that's, that's what's behind the whole self-identity stuff. Now, I just wanna make one other point uh, in, in response to that excellent question. What philosophy posits, or what, let's, let's see what posits, what it discovers, what it has as its heart is, is the primacy of reason as against the primacy of will. If it's, if it's the primacy of will, then there really can't be philosophy. You know, as Nietzsche famously said that um, Socrates' uh, philosophy was simply a, the, a cover, it was the will to power. It wasn't really an attempt to uh, comprehend objective reality. It was an attempt to impose on that reality. So that would, that's why, of course, the, the supremacy of the will, the will to power. You either have that will to power or you have the primacy of reason. Now the United States was by, based upon the primacy of reason. That's why we have legislatures, let us reason together. Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, clearly based upon the primacy of will the supremacy of will, the triumph of the will, famously put. So I don't think um, every interpretation is an act of the will. Uh, many of them are genuine attempts at understanding. Good. John Eastman uh, no, says, I, I agree with your assessment that modern America seems to have rejected the laws of nature and nature's God but results as a pluralism of viewpoints, excluding those that get canceled, of course, that seem in, incapable of disavowing viewpoints that would destroy the possibility of reasoned reflection. Do you think there's any way such a relativistic pluralism can provide a coherent response to the radical Islamist ideology? Can a relativist provide an adequate response to the Islamist ideology. I don't- Shall I repeat uh, that? Was, did yeah, you capture that or, or would you like me to repeat did, did, did I Did I catch the essence of it in, in my- Yeah, the suggestion was um, that what we've gotten in, in contemporary America is a pluralism of viewpoints that seems incapable of disavowing those viewpoints that would destroy the possibility of reasoned reflection. And he wonders, John wonders, if there's any way that such a relativistic pluralism can provide a coherent response to the radical Islamist ideology. No, I think, uh, thank you, John, for that rhetorical question. The answer is no, as you know. Um, it, 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 the very strange thing about some of the leftist ideologues is that they have uh, allied themselves with Islamists without it having occurred to them that were the Islamists to succeed, they would be the first ones to go. But you know, this isn't all that unfamiliar to the period of the Cold War with which I'm very familiar as a former Cold Warrior, when radical left forces within um, Western societies allied themselves with the, the Soviet Union. And, and it was for the same reason that the left-wing ideologues do with Islamists today is because they shared a common enemy. That is the Western democratic institutions. And, um, but it's a, it's a highly unnatural alliance and um, that will be quickly disposed of should uh, their Islamist allies win. And by the way, some of them are finding this out in, in Europe and, and some of them are waking up to what they've done. Uh, in France, President Macron 
and and maybe I hope a little bit in in Great Britain. Uh, there's nothing wrong with with Muslim immigration. It, it shouldn't be a problem so long as the Muslims are assimilable into a constitutional democratic order. If you're letting in people who deny those principles, then you're asking for your own demise. Good. Here's another question. How did historic cultures, for instance, England, overcome tribalism? And how can present day Americans overcome tribalism without a modern day Aristotle as a guide? Well, in the case of England, they were conquered. <laughs> well, only partially joking, of course, by the Romans and later by the Normans. Um, well, I'll tell you, the, that, that, that would really take some time to answer your question, which is why I wrote a book about it, in case any of you have forgotten, America on Trial, A Defense of the Founding, in which I dwell upon uh, our English heritage and how the constitutional principles developed within it. And many of those arrived, curiously enough, with um, religious orders, which had themselves developed them from canon law. I know that's going to be a real head scratcher, but it, I hope it piques your curiosity enough to, to buy the book because it's all explained therein. You know, the the idea that there's no taxation without representation was first developed in, in the Middle Ages. It arose out of canon law, which, which discovered something similar in the Justinian Code, which had been rediscovered, I think it was in the 11th century. Um, it, it's, 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 it's such a rich history, I can't really I can't really go into it uh, in, in any depth here, but you know, the, the end of tribalism in England or anywhere is to, a, to or it certainly has been the case in Europe, is it's, a, it's an influence of two things, Christianity and philosophy. And since Christianity assimilated so much of Greek philosophy, many people get both those things from one source. Um, that all men are created equal is, is a truth that can be arrived at philosophically, we know. It also is a general principle of Christianity um, that expanded upon the deep meaning of Genesis that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. And then later in the gospels, there's, you know, there, there's, there's no Greek, there's no Jew, we're all under the, the same God. So this, this principle of equality was conveyed very powerfully by both faith and reason. You mentioned in your answer, um, I think two answers ago, um, you, you mentioned Macron and and, and some hopes for England um, as well. Which brings us to another question, which was um, which, which current world leaders are you particularly impressed with and why? Perhaps impressed in particular with their ability to, to deal with um, uh, tribalistic ideological, um, tri tribalistic ideologies, let's say. Perhaps I should add, if any. Well, I think the countries that have showed a great deal of sense in, in actions uh, just out of their own self-preservation uh, have to include Hungary, both in the way in which it's dealt with immigration, uh, assimilation, 
and unabashedly and unashamedly uh, standing up for Western civilization and its principles. Good. Do you see, I, I'm curious, do you see uh, the fundamental problem um, uh, to be solved in immigration problem as in immigration policy as a matter of uh, returning to an assimilationist model that that's been um, out of fashion as as of course you know for for decades now. Well, I'm not sure it's complete. I. Where I, my closest neighbors are Vietnamese boat people. My children grew up with their children. One of their sons is now working at the highest levels of American national security. Uh, another neighbor next to closest neighbor was a Russian physicist. Um, I, there are any number of, of people from other countries. My own wife is, is Spanish. I see that this process of assimilation still working as long as it's not consciously disavowed by renouncing our own principles and as the British have done, not leaving anything to be assimilated into. Now, um, I have, if you've ever been to a, a swearing in ceremony for new US citizens, they have to swear to defend and uphold the United States Constitution. And they do have to un undergo um, a, a test. They have to answer an exam, which I doubt if more than 15% of high school students in America today could, could answer. So something, at least something is required of them. And as, as far as um, immigration policy, I would certainly not let anyone in uh, who would not take that oath or admit to the fundamental truths of the American founding that all people are created equal. You know, just as we wouldn't, if, there were, if someone, uh, if there were a resurgence in the Aztec religion and someone wanted to immigrate here and, and start uh, you know, build a, building a, a pyramid on, in their property and sacrificing people, we probably wouldn't allow that, even in the name of pluralism. I think we have time for, I think, I think you're right. <laughs> I hope so, hope so. I think we have time for, for one more question. Um, and uh, I'll, I think this is a good one to, to end on. Um, someone asks uh, about your experience, uh, obviously your, your, your great experience um, in, in the Middle East, whether you think that uh, the tribalism of the Middle East um, makes the hope, the hope that I'd add shared by um, what used to be called neoconservatives and also liberal interventionists. Does the tribalism make the hope of exporting liberal democratic ideals uh, untenable, at least in the short or medium run? Yeah, it does. I, I think that, um... I, for one, was not surprised by the failure of the Arab Spring. The, um, as an Egyptian friend of mine said, there's no democracy in Egypt because there are no Democrats, small d Democrats in Egypt. Well, they're, they're a tiny minority, a very tiny minority. The, the question to be asked in a place like that or where, where indeed, you know, tribe, tribe is not so powerful a force as it is in, in other countries of the Middle East, but nonetheless, the, question, the questions arise, uh, are all people created equal? Well, are, are men and women equal? No. Well, are Muslims and non-Muslims equal? No. Jews and Muslims? No. 
Now, there are legal uh, answers to these questions in some of those countries in the Middle East where technically speaking, you would say, well, they are equal, um, but culturally, certainly they're not. They're not, the culture hasn't accepted it. And one reason why this has never happened in the Middle East and to most of the Middle East, at least in, you know, in, the, Sunni, in the Sunni predominant areas is that philosophy was never institutionalized. In fact, it was banned. There, there was a huge struggle, which I won't go into because I know Dan wants to have dinner, uh, is, is um, there was a huge struggle in, in fairly early Islam over the status of reason. And the earliest theological school was a proponent of natural law and embraced philosophy. However, the, the, the school of theology, which developed in opposition to it, denigrated reason, denied the existence of natural law. And unfortunately, they won, not, not by force of argument, but through force of arms, through the, through the caliph, the, the, all you needed was the caliph. So I, no, I don't, not, not anytime soon, perhaps someday, if anywhere in Iran sooner than anywhere else, because Shiism never, never expurgated philosophy. Well, I hate to end on a pessimistic note, but at, but ending on a realistic note, um, let's let's think of it as ending on a realistic note instead. One of the problems with these Zoom, uh, perhaps the, the biggest problem with these 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 Zoom events is that there's no. A uh, good way of showing our appreciation um, to the speaker. But um, I hope that uh, those of you in the audience will join me in thanking Robert Riley for a provocative and always interesting talk. And thank you. Dan, thank you very much for hosting it. I very much appreciate it and appreciate Betty's help throughout as well. She's wonderful. Thanks again. Yeah.